Hey folks, I'm here with Wasea Whitebird. Uh, he is a member of city council in Ashland, Wisconsin. Also, not ashamed to say that he is a member of the Communist Party, one of the few elected officials we have here in the United States, who is also a Communist Party member. And uh, he reached out to me uh, that he thought it would be good that we have a little chat about the classic book by Lenin, Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder which uh, I believe Lenin, uh, he gave it a subtitle. I believe it's called like a popular essay on tactics. Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's uh, Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, a popular essay in Marxist strategy and tactics by Vladimir Lenin. Very good. All right. Um, I think it's one of Lenin's best and most readable works, by the way. Um, you know, it's, it's very to the point. Uh, the book is in several parts. And it's not what you would expect. Um, it's certainly not what you would expect. So, Wasea, why don't you start out by giving us uh, your overall thoughts on the work, its significance, why it's relevant in our current time? Of course, of course. So the book largely talks on parliamentary tactics uh, from the standpoint of when Lenin was engaging, and then he highlights a couple of discussions of when uh, the British Labour Party uh, and other communist movements in Britain were uh, also having their own issues in regards to parliamentary politics. Um, so the, the book here highlights a couple of strategies that need to be addressed. The left wing communism he highlights here is uh, largely a criticism on having no compromises whatsoever. And on the other spectrum, he does also highlight that uh, to not fall into the other end of the spectrum of, of, of going too far the other direction where you always make compromises at every single opportunity to the point where you're harming your own movement. So there, there's, a, there's a fine balance he strikes here. And largely, this book is packed with tons of nuance and tries to help navigate, uh, even for its time, the difficult landscape of having to deal with uh, multi-party elections and so on. Yeah, well, the context of the book is very interesting because after the Russian Revolution, um, you know, the global Marxist movement had sold out and supported World War One. So after this, you know, the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks came to power and they started the third international, the communist international. It would be a, a revolutionary Marxist international. And all these people around the world, all these radicals and some of them were almost anarchists and others were joining it. And they joined it simply on the basis of, hey, the Bolsheviks had guns and they had a revolution and they took power. Uh, they had a violent revolution. We want to have a violent revolution. So I guess we're the same as the Bolsheviks. And uh, the, the, the Bolsheviks and the Communist International had to make these 21 points that parties had to agree to uh, in order to join. For example, the South African Communist Party, they wanted to join. Um, but they had white supremacism in their like constitution. And so Lenin and the Bolsheviks said, no, you can't join the Communist International if you believe in white supremacy. Um, so the South African Communist Party, a new party that didn't believe in white supremacy was formed and they eventually joined the Communist International, right? And that, um, that and, you know, all these folks, a lot of them had been attracted to the Bolsheviks, didn't know what the Bolsheviks were really about, uh, didn't really know what the Bolsheviks believed, how they'd been able to come to power, just kind of liked them on the basis of, hey, these guys are violent revolutionaries. And so uh, a lot of these forces that were really attracted to the Communist International were, were what you might call ultra left, or he calls them left wing communists. Um, there's a joke, right, that, you know, if, if Lenin, right, thinks that you're too left wing, it's got to hurt, right? That would be like hanging out <laughs> with like, the funniest comedian and he says you're too silly or something like that, you know. But, but at the end of the day, I mean, he's referring to a political deviation, people that are, are trying to be so radical that in the process they hurt the revolutionary movement. Um, the opening part of it, he goes over the history of the Bolshevik movement and their different tactics. What struck you about that section? All right. So for the beginning of the book, um, let's see. So it's, it's been it's been a I, I was reading around different parts of it. So just to kind of refresh myself real quick here. All right. Ah, yes. Let's struggle against enemies within the working class movement and Bolshevism grow strength and grow steeled. All right, so within the Bolshevik movement, from highlighting some of the senses you were taking, there was the ultra-violent discussion, of, of course, um, that coming from the perspective of the German communists, that uh, there was a criticism there in regards towards, oh, 
sorry, I just got done over reading over this book. I'm still trying to remember a couple other parts of it. Um, perhaps you can rephrase the question another way that might recall. Okay, well, sure. I mean, the book is has several parts to it. Um, you know, in the opening, he goes over the history of Bolshevism. Um, and then the Bolshevik movement and the kind of the leaps and the evolutions. And then from there, he starts like applying the lessons of the Russian Revolution to revolutionaries around the world. Uh, he talks about like the debate, should you run and participate in elections, for example? Uh, right. He talks should you join labor unions that are not communist, for example? Um, and he has a very specific approach to those questions. What struck you, I guess, in his overall view? Overall, uh, of course. The nuance struck me the best on these discussions. Like, yes, we should participate in reactionary labor unions, not because they in themselves will be re revolutionary, but they will provide a, uh, they will help connect the masses towards a greater part participation in the movements of what was currently ongoing. Um, so the nuance is what struck me the best throughout the entire entirety of the book. And uh, I guess you could say it's real politic in this regard. Uh, but that's the fact of the matter. And for me, the discussion about having compromises when it's necessary to when uh, to when it's not seems to really resonate throughout the rest of the tone of the book. Uh, Lenin wasn't really into cancel culture. That's what strikes me, right? There's this attitude you get among radicals these days. Oh, you don't agree with me on blank? Well, F you. Go away. You're... Lenin didn't have that attitude, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and like in the United States, this 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 section on should we join non-revolutionary labor unions that was particularly relevant to the United States because we had a revolutionary labor union, the IWW, and then we had a reactionary labor federation, the American Federation of Labor, which was you know racist, which was reformist, which was awful, right? Yeah. And on Reed and a lot of the founders of the American Communist Party wanted to have the Communist Party members refuse to join the AFL and only join the IWW. And yeah. Lenin said to them, no, you got to join the big labor federation and push for revolutionary politics inside of it. Um, you know, and uh, and I feel like a lot of radicals nowadays, a lot, you know, the, the Internet culture of radicalism is like, well, one person, oh, you disagree with me? Well, F you, go away. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that that's not how you actually reach people. That's not how you build a movement, right? And especially, yeah. right, that... that and, and it's still relevant today, because, I mean, yeah. you can still talk about the AFL-CIO trying to back police unions in, in, in a very, in, in a way that's very uh, reactionary, of course. And people who are participating in AFL-CIO who have a relative, re revolutionary view shouldn't stop to uh, work to undermine that viewpoint within the AFL-CIO just because they disagree with it. And people shouldn't be disbarred from participating in it because that is the official narrative of, of that organization and it is subject to change. That's where the workers are. They are in this union. So if you announce, well, I'm too pure, I'm too good to join this union because they have police in it or they vote for Republicans or whatever, yeah. you do, um, then you have just cut yourself off from all of those workers in that union by, you know, um, and, and it seems like, you know, there's an old expression, you never cut off your nose despite your face. Yeah. You, ever, yeah. that, you know, and, uh, that's, that's a new one. I like it though. Yeah. And that he seems to be pointing out that, that communists and revolutionaries all throughout, uh, all throughout the world, uh, often do that in the name of trying to make themselves feel so pure and so revolutionary and so radical. Uh, they they screw themselves and they yeah, yeah. and and that's that's a large section of this book in the beginning here where he criticizes the pure communists who say that to that we should reject uh, that we that in the book anyway at least on the citations he was making was that there were people who were advocating for boycotting elections in general uh, now that that seems to me almost asinine and yeah, yeah like like why would you why would you like just boycott an entire election not even give not even in the most petty sense even just to give your your vote towards a third party and that's an entire discussion unto itself whether or not that's relevant but what not voting on the entirety on the basis that it's a compromise and we should not make compromises is completely childish and asinine that's the way i've come at this well one of the revolutionary leaders that he singles out for criticism in the book is a very prominent British feminist named Sylvia Pankhurst. Um, and I, she's a fascinating figure, by the way, historically. Um, she was kind of the uh, the mother of the black bloc, in a way. Um, 
uh, you know, because women couldn't vote in Britain. So she was organizing for the right of women to vote. Um, and she actually wrote essays about why window smashing uh, was the road to women, <laughs> women voting. Uh, and she, you know, called on women to get their umbrellas and go and break the windows of members of parliament who didn't believe in women voting. And she was all about direct action. And, um, you know, she took this position, you know, don't vote revolt. Right. Uh, you know, and and Lenin speaks very highly of her, says she's very articulate. She's one of the, the best agitators in Britain but basically calls her out for taking ultra leftist positions. Um, and she eventually, you know, she quit the Communist Party uh, because she disagreed with Bolshevism. And she ended up becoming this prominent anarchist in Britain in the 1920s. But then uh, she had an affair with Haile Selassie, which I think is even more hilarious, right? Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia. Uh, yeah. uh, Mussolini invaded Ethiopia and removed him. So he was in exile in Britain during World War II. And during that time, he and S Sylvia Pankhurst had a fling, which is really hilarious. <laughs> small know. world, small right, world. Right, right. Um, but he, he 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 praises her. He talks about how dedicated of a revolutionary she is, but he, he disagrees with her on this question of voting. I thought that was particularly powerful. What do you think? Hmm. I wasn't aware of uh, Halle Selassie having an affair with a person that Lenin criticized in his book. That That's very new to me. Yeah. Uh, so what, what I think about this on the spot, um, you know, I, I wasn't, I was very, I, mean, I guess, keeping on tabs with uh, Pali Selassie as the, uh, he was a ruler nonetheless of Ethiopia, if you want to recall. Um, and he, he did help, uh, him and his forces, Ethiopia helped drive back the Italians. But um I guess that's important to note that other leaders of other countries were recognizing that Lenin's work and his contribution is important. Uh, however, in speaking the truth, I do not know entirely a whole much about the history of Ethiopia with Haile Selassie. Well, I mean, it kind of applies to this conversation. I mean, that was decades yeah. after this book was written. But, you know, Haile Selassie was the emperor of an African country, one of the only African countries that was not a colony or was an independent country. Um, and he was not a democratic leader. He was, you know, an emperor. Uh, it was a feudal country. Uh, but the Italian fascists invaded. And then the communists all over the world formed hands off Ethiopia committees and protests all over the country, all over the United States, all over the world, uh, saying hands off Ethiopia um, and, uh, you know, protesting the invasion by the Italian fascists. And uh, the Soviet Union stood alone in the League of Nations condemning this. And the idea was, you know, OK, so Haile Selassie, he's not a communist. He's not a socialist. He's a feudal lord. But the imperialists are always the main enemy. And the Italian fascists have no right to their invasion. And actually, um, uh, you know, a lot of black nationalists joined with the Communist Party to protest in Harlem and in Chicago and elsewhere. And so it, it kind of shows that, you know, somebody who's like taking like an ultra leftist position might say, well, Haile Selassie, you know, he's an emperor and the Italian fascists are bad. I'm neutral. I'm for communism in Ethiopia. Well, that, there's a war going on. There's two sides there. Are you for, you know, the, the, the fascist invaders? Or are you for the Ethiopians? Well, the communists were for the Ethiopians, right? Of course, of uh, course. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of relates to this book, even though the, 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 I mean, you can have constructive criticism for like two sides of a faction. I mean, uh, you can you can talk about that that sort of criticism of uh, of just more recently with like in more modern history with Desert Storm, for example. Saddam Hussein went and invaded Ra uh, Kuwait to essentially try to help offset, from what I understand, the economy after the tanker war between 1980 and 1988. And uh, following that, you had uh, Iraq invading Kuwait, and then you had the United States in, in, in trying to go back to repel the forces that Saddam had. But it's important to keep note of this, like on a critical support that, yeah, you can choose to support the United States for, to push the Iraqi forces out of Kuwait because of its unlawful invasion of Kuwait. But at the same time, recognize a couple of things, you know. One, the United States had been supporting Saddam Hussein for decades prior, uh, for and helped funded Saddam Hussein and provided him and and in conjunction with West Germany and the U.S. provided chemical weapons to to Saddam through that, um, and you know he he used he used a lot of awful things and by no means this is no no means a uh, support a total support for the United States but to have nuance and and a 
a, a, a fuller understanding of the historical context that has to be provided. So in that in, in this regard, uh, you, you could say, yeah, it was maybe right for the United States to go into Kuwait and, and push the Iraqi forces up. However, it is important to note that they had used, you know, things like depleted uranium and their weapons, which have a half-life of 4.5 billion years and it's very difficult to clean up and it's very awful stuff. I learned about that when I was about 16. Um, and it's kind of stuck with me for that because that's something that has occurred after 91 where you would see it in Kosovo and otherwise. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Iraq war, I mean, the Gulf war, the, the, yeah. the first, you know, Iraq war, the United States gave Saddam Hussein permission to invade Kuwait. Um, yeah. And that was that was the big thing that, that, that kind that's of, what that's what I heard. I hadn't totally confirmed it, but that's what I heard. Yeah. Ramsey Clark wrote a very, very good book, you know, exposing the lies of that war called Fire This Time. And as soon as the United States made clear uh, that they were going to drive Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, the Iraqis retreated. You know, and they just piled onto the highways retreating. And it's the famous highway of death where, uh, you know, the Iraqi army was massacred while it was retreating by the U.S. military, you know. And then the U.S. took the opportunity to then bomb Iraq and kill hundreds of thousands of civilians. And, you know, it was, it was you know, Iraq was kind of set up. It was a setup, uh, basically. And, you know, Saddam Hussein, you know, he was a Baathist. Uh, he, you know, he, he, you know, he very much advocated a, a form of Arab socialism. He, he, you know, had supported and armed the Palestinians. Uh, he had been an ally with the U.S. against Iran, but he had some anti-imperialist aspects. And it was it was a complicated situation. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and, and again, you know, that kind of gets back to, you know, something Lenin always made clear, which was the imperialists are always the, the main enemy. You know, the, the imperialists, the Western colonizers, they're always the main enemy um, in a situation like that. But back to left wing communism, though. Um, it's easy to track. I do apologize. I do apologize. That's OK. It's a book about tactics, you know. Um, yeah. You know, there's one particular section of, of the book that people will often refer to, because when he's talking about Britain and he's going over Sylvia Pankers, he is arguing that British communists need to support the Labour Party of, of Britain at that time, not necessarily forever or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the context is fascinating because it's just so eerily <laughs> reminiscent of today. I mean, mm -hmm. not exactly. Of course, it's a completely different situation, but there are like echoes, you know, um, for example, like so the British Labour Party was the party that represented British labor unions. Right. And it was new at that point, And it had supported World War One and sold out and supported World War One, was not supporting the Russian Revolution. And so a lot of these British communists like Sylvia Pankhurst are saying, screw the Labour Party. Labour Party's awful. We're going to not vote for them. We're going to not participate in the elections. So, you know. Lenin points out that at that time, uh, there was this whole crazy campaign against the Labour Party uh, centered around this thing called the Zinoviev letter. Have you ever heard of the Zinoviev letter? No, I hadn't. I hadn't. Uh, it was uh, basically the Russiagate of uh, Britain in the 1920s. Um, they had this fake letter from Zinoviev. Zinoviev was the leader of the Russian Revolution. He did not write this letter, but they, the Lloyd George, uh, who was the British uh, leader, you know, had this fake letter claiming that the Bolsheviks had written a letter to the Labour Party and were supporting the Labour Party and were cooperating with them. And on that basis, they were trying to outlaw the Labour Party. They were calling the Labour Party secret communists, all kinds of things. Right. So the Labour Party was facing this hysterical, stupid anti-communist campaign based on a forged letter called the Zinoviev letter. Right. OK. Yeah, yeah. In that context, Lenin says, OK, so right now, British working class people, not communists, not revolutionaries, but they have this labor party that wants them to get like free health care and free education and stuff. And the bosses are in this hysterical anti-communist campaign and trying to outlaw it and all of this. Under these circumstances, you have to vote for the Labour Party. Right. If you don't campaign for the Labour Party, if you don't show solidarity with the workers who see their party as under attack. Uh, you know, you're going to look, you're going to not be relevant, right? The, the yeah. big issue in Britain, right? If the, only, if the only party that is trying to protect you from being outlawed or at least even allow for efforts to peacefully operate, you know, within a certain amount of legality is going to be shut down, then you should try to operate to protect that party, of course. Right. And, uh, and so then, you especially, know, especially when it's pushing for platforms that you aren't too far removed from and you have overlap on. Yeah. And and so then, you know, he goes over all the, the, you know, the griping and complaining. They say, well, we wouldn't support the Labour Party because of this. We wouldn't support the Labour Party because of that. 
And so Lenin says that uh, the, the line is, we'll be supporting the Labour Party the same way a rope supports a hanged man. Yeah, yeah. I and, remember that line. And he's essentially saying, we're going to support the Labour Party so we can get to all the Labour Party's supporters. And, and, then, he, and then he can take out the Hendersons and the jo Lloyd Georges. And yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, yeah, he goes about that line. I remember that. I remember that bit. I remember that bit. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just seems like the theme of the text over and over is you should never build any unnecessary barrier between yourself and the working class. Right. Yeah. You know, if there's a labor union, fine. It's not a revolutionary union. Go and join that labor union. Convince the workers in it to be communist. There's an election coming up. Right. And there's kind of a socialist progressive candidate. Go and join their campaign. Participate in that campaign and convince all the people that are campaigning for them to be communists. Right. Uh, yeah your own candidate run your own candidate so that you have a, a role in the debate right um right. but, but it, it's this line of you, you never want to build an unnecessary barrier between yourself and the broad masses of people right of the course. point is to reach the masses of people i think that's that's the point of the book and when we get to like the modern discussion about like the current elections of course i don't feel like we should try to negate this discussion and uh, during during this episode but um because it is coming up for november this is, of course, a very heated topic, and it's a very heated discussion, even within my organization. Um, so there's a couple of perspectives, you know. Um, you have one that says that we should always back the Democratic Party in a way that comes off as the most uncritical um, at every at every turn. And I feel like this particular tone has some ramifications within our party. In speaking openly, that uh, that we don't ha exercise nuance, even holding this position of whether or not you're going to vote for Biden or you're going to vote for a progressive socialist candidate, um, there is some difficulties there to navigate. In I, I think in this current climate, and so where where would uh, where where should folks stand or even have an idea? is something that is beyond my own individual comprehension. But uh, in regards to LWC, uh, if you've, I guess it comes down to a sort of uh, perspective on this. If you feel that Biden is going to make strides to prevent whatever Trump might be doing, then I guess you could make the argument to vote for him. However, I have... I have, uh, I guess, I guess you could say, a difficulty in seeing the genuineness in his platform. Something that Lenin does discuss that there will be people who try to try to who op or try to campaign to get progressives to vote for them by saying everything but doing nothing in their actions. Uh, so there is a need to be ju to judge candidates based on what they do, and I feel that sometimes gets lost in the book. Well, you know, one interesting thing about the book, and I mean, I'm going to leave that question up. I don't take a position on how people should vote you know, and all of that as yeah. a journalist. You can say whatever you want, but I'm just telling you, my viewers know that I, I don't take a position. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, one thing that strikes me as interesting is that I believe in this text if, and, and elsewhere, uh, Lenin talks about how in Russia, uh, before the Russian Revolution, there was like a fascist movement called the Black Hundreds Party. Uh, have you ever heard? Is, is that in left wing communism? I believe uh, yeah, it is. I think I heard of it. It was like the black yeah. or, or at least if it wasn't, I heard of it. it the black hundreds. Wasn't that like a fascist organization? Yes, it was. And they were anti-Semitic um, and they were super czarist and they didn't believe in progressive reforms. And they were going around committing violence against Jewish people. And they had seats in the, the parliament, in the Duma. Um, and, uh, you know, the question, you know, was how should the Bolsheviks uh, relate to this party? Right. And, uh, you know, should they support like the, you know, the constitutional Democrats and the liberals against them? How should they they relate to it? And Lenin actually says um, what the Bolsheviks should do is go to their meetings and argue with them. Um, and that's what the Bolsheviks did. If there was going to be a black hundreds party meeting in some area, they would go to it and debate them and argue with them. And in a lot of cases, they would recruit a lot of workers who'd been caught up in this anti-Semitic confusion. They would recruit them away from the black hundreds party to the Bolshevik party. Um, and that uh, that Lenin argued that uh, that that basically you need to you need to confront uh, these backward ideas and win working class people away from them. Again, not cancel culture, not saying, oh, yo, you went to a black hundreds party meeting. Well, get out of here. You're 
No, but, but sitting down saying, no, what you believe is wrong. The answer is this and engaging with the people in a winning way and winning them away from this fascist program toward a, a progressive socialist program. I think that's fascinating. Indeed. Indeed. I definitely do like this approach. Um, I think, but I think there's a lot of difficulty to, to it today that there isn't a lot of experience generated in this sort of confrontation that becomes difficult to relate to people in their perspective. And that takes, and it's a very fine art to, to negotiate somebody who's on the opposite side of the political spectrum to come to even consider coming to your end. And that's if they're willing. Uh, right. Sometimes you get some people who are just absolutely blindedly or deafeningly stubborn. Well, you know, and it's fascinating because, you know, Lenin puts this out at the very beginning of the Communist International, right? And, and for the first, you know, 10 years of the Communist International, they really tried to have a united front program. And in Britain, in the United States, in Germany and elsewhere, the idea was they would try to work with the Social Democrats, try to work with the anarchists, and just have, like, single demands they could all agree on. Like, in the United States, they had rallies to free Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs was in federal prison. Um, you know, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, the anarchist groups would all have joint rallies to free Eugene Debs. They would have joint days of action for an eight hour work day. Right. And the idea was that Lenin was arguing that communists needed to build some kind of united front with different factions in the working class movement. Um, and, uh, you know, the response of the Social Democrats to this, to this united front was to go into an anti-communist hysteria. Um, and, you know, in Germany, the Social Democrats killed a lot of communists. Uh, in the United States, the AFL made a ban on any Communist Party member joining um, joining an AFL union. So they had to like join in secret. They would join and like not tell them they were communists. And and you know the the, the Social Democrats went into this anti-communist frenzy. So then you know Lenin dies. You know Stalin came into leadership of the of the Communist International. 1928, they had the sixth Congress of the Communist International, and they changed their tactics. Right. They, they said that the tactic was a united front. No longer did they want a united front. They wanted a united front from below, meaning that they weren't going to try to unite with the organization. They would just try to get to the masses from below, right? Um, and then they started calling social democrats social fascists. The idea was the social democrats, they're socialist in word, but they're fascist in deeds, right? Um, and they started arguing the social democrats were actually the main enemy. Right. And so the Communist Party in the United States and the Socialist Party, they hated each other. They were enemies in Germany. The Communist Party and the Socialist Party were shooting at each other. That was the policy. And it was united front from below. And also at that point, the world economy crashed with the Great Depression. So the communists started organizing their united front from below by building these unemployment councils and these labor unions that they controlled and stuff. So the communists started to really, really grow with this tactic. But they always had this this problem. They were like blood enemies of the Social Democrats. But then. Hitler came to power in Germany. So after mm -hmm. Hitler came into power, right, and they saw the disaster of, of Nazism, they had the seventh World Congress of the Communist International, and they changed the line again. And instead of building a united front from below, they started building a people's front against fascism. And the idea was the communists would sit at the center of a, of a global effort to defeat fascism. Right. And it, and and and, you know, the idea was that capitalism is naturally leading toward fascism, naturally leading to, toward war. And because communists are anti capitalist and can get rid of the root cause of it, they'll be the most effective anti fascist fighters. So the communists have to sit at the center of this anti fascist popular front or people's front. So that, you know, that, that's the communist international. They were constantly struggling to develop their tactics. First, they had the United Front. Then they had the United Front from below. Then they had the Popular Front. Um, and then obviously after the Second World War, you know, things changed again. And it shows that they were constantly coming back to the drawing board and saying what works, what works, what doesn't work. Right. You know, OK, we had a United Front. OK, now we have a United Front from below. OK, now we have a Popular Front. And great, great successes and great you know, setbacks happened with all of those policies, I think. Um, but there was a willingness to change tactics and, and to see what would work. Some people blame the United Front from below for Hitler coming to power. That's a common argument. They say, well, the communists and the Social Democrats were at each other's throats, and that created an opening for Hitler to come into power. Uh, that's a common argument. Other people say the Popular Front was too reformist and not revolutionary enough, that, that, that under the Popular Front, uh, the communists, they were just kissing ass to Roosevelt and the Democrats, and they weren't really revolutionary enough. There are criticisms you can make of the different tactics, but the idea was the point is to win. Right. The point is to actually get to socialism. And um, 
I think the history of the communist international is fascinating. Um, in addition to the book we're discussing tonight, one of the most important books that I've ever read is The History of the Three Internationals by William Z. Foster. That is mm. by my favorite, uh, you know, probably the most educational book on Marxism I've ever read, where he goes over from Marx all the way up to World War II, the history of global communism and the different debates and the different movements. And I know. I, yeah, I know that there was a lot of condemnation about the Second International. Um, so I guess I'll have to check that out. I didn't hear about that book from William Z. Foster. Yeah. Um, but I will definitely have to take a look at it of the first, second, and third internationals. Yeah. yeah the first international was Karl Marx and the anarchists and, uh, Marx and the anarchists were fighting too much and it fell apart. The second international was huge. That was the social Democrats or the socialist international. Um, and it was huge and it was, you know, the biggest party was in Germany, but it was the British labor party. It's still around. It's called, um, the socialist international. I think DSA used to be part of it, but it's not anymore. But it's it, it's the Socialist International. But, you know, in the lead up to World War One, all the parties in the Second International promised that they would never support World War One. And then when World War One started, they all changed their minds. They dissolved the international and they were all killing each other. And Lenin, at that point, he said the Second International is a stinking corpse. Right. And um, and yeah. and and the Second International was seen as the great betrayal, you know, where all these working class parties, labor unions, ended up supporting a war where millions of workers killed each other and it was a disaster and it was the great betrayal and that's why then the Bolsheviks started the third international and then during the second world war Stalin dissolved the, the third international to make the point that um, that you know you know it, it, there was a lot of feeling that the Soviet Union was trying to foment revolution all over the world and all that so by dissolving that that was a way to show that the communists were united in the anti-fascist war um, but it was also, you know, they kind of realized that having, you know, having one global group in Moscow that directs all the communists of the world probably wasn't a good strategy. The Chinese communists kind of had their own methods and strategies and that they were using, uh, you know, communists in Yugoslavia, communists in different countries, and that they needed to allow more autonomy. Having one communist international may not have been the best strategy. Um, and there are still, you know, you know, things that are kind of like the Third International are still around. Like uh, there's, I believe there's something called the, what is it? The International International Congress of Communist and Workers Parties, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's it's not it's kind of like the Communist International, but it's like it's not binding, you know, different. Communist yeah. For, yeah. Parties. So so far, yeah. like in my discourse that I've been involved with, there hasn't been two significance of like a summit of international communists. There seems to be a few places that are kind of gathering for like in Ecuador or otherwise. But um, I haven't found too many international organizations that have been as prevalent as as what i've been hearing from like the internationals of, of the past well there's a youth uh, organization tied to the united nations called the world democratic youth federation and they have a festival every four years that almost every communist party in the world will send delegates to it's called the world festival of youth and students i've been to two of them it's amazing amazing festivals amazing gatherings uh, there's also something called the international democrat or the in international women's democratic federation um, and they have gatherings like congresses of world women that communist parties from all around the world will send with, you know, women delegates to. Um, and then there's something called the World Federation of Trade Unions, uh, which is kind of a communist uh, labor union coalition, a, a coalition of labor unions around the world. So, you know, it still kind of exists, but they're very loose now. You know, at the World Festival, yeah. there were all kinds of groups. And it's not just communists, too. I mean, at the World Festival of Youth and Students, uh, there were a lot of like progressive Latin American folks uh, that, that I saw. There were a lot of, um, you know, like the Syrian Baath attended, um, you know, like uh, the young Peronistas of, of Argentina attended, you know, and th those are not necessarily communists, but they're anti-imperialist, you know, I, I believe, yeah, you know, and that was the youth festivals. So, I mean, there is, you know, quote unquote, international communism is still around, but it's much looser, you know, and I think that's one thing people learned from the Cold War is that, you know, the way a communist party in a country might need to operate and the way a communist government that's actually in power and trying to build socialism might operate might be night and day. You know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, for example, China really liked Richard Nixon. China thought Nixon was great. Well, communists in America thought Nixon was a reactionary, you know. Well, you although, know. Although, although you could argue, I, although I didn't hear this from somebody that's uh, saying uh, Nixon was advocating for uh, Medicare for all of the time. Right. And, yeah, that, 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 that always that always makes me scratch my brain a little bit 
But yeah, uh, universal basic income too. He, he called for a universal basic income. But that was in the context of a huge struggle. There were huge protests in the, in the Black Liberation Movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. And Nixon was vicious um, in terms of crushing the Black Panther Party, crushing the Black Freedom Movement, uh, you know, bombing Vietnam and killing millions of people. Um, but he was trying to stabilize the country. And so he did, and he created the Environmental Protection Agency. He lowered the voting age to 18. He did a lot of progressive-ish things in the hopes of like stabilizing the country and not having more chaos and unrest. And that goes to show that at the end of the day, it's popular struggles that make all the difference, right? I mean, that, that would be but, but because Nixon met with Mao, you know, China liked Nixon. And uh, when Nixon was forced out of office, China thought that was not a good move. Whereas most of the communists in the USA saw Nixon as a right-winger, as a warmonger, and, and actually had been protesting to remove Nixon. And that shows that at the end of the day, what a socialist country might want and what a socialist, you know, activist in that country might want doesn't always line up. Um, and I think, you know, people expect China to be like, you know, sending weapons all over the world and fomenting. No, oh, no, no, I, 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 I have been over that with so many folks. Okay, where do I begin with that? Where, where do I begin? Okay, um, so China. Uh, I'm on the discussion of China. This is almost a, a deviating topic. I do apologize, but all right, so. Uh, from what I understand that I've gathered and other folks like Richard D. Wolf kind of exemplify this this factor that the trade between China and the U.S. followed with two sort of things. One, you had on one hand, the United States, we had the sort of quashing of, of labor unions that began largely towards the late 70s, early 80s, uh, trying to uh, clamp down labor unions in the United States. This, of course, was a reactionary measure. But on the other hand, for China, following the Sino-Soviet split, and you can really argue about that. I'm not going to get into that tonight. Who, uh, You had China who was looking for a way to help industrialize its economy uh, at a rapid pace. So what was the exchange that was sort of made? And, you could, and from what I understand, it was that China was willing to offer the labor in exchange for technology. It was a technology transfer. There, there, there's no, I don't think there's any consensus about that debate. Uh, the the need for China to have the access to a lot of Western technologies for developing uh, either computerized systems, uh, in, new new forms of industry, etc., was a great boost for the mass of its people. And on the other hand, you had the quashing of labor unions in the United States, and then there comes the question about you know how how tied were the movements in the United States in concern with China, and was that even a factor, or, and was that just all haphazardly, uh, just kind of left to whim, which I, I'm, I'm kind of finding it sort of was. Um, however, it's not to say that there isn't some criticism for uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping. In my in my experience, you had, uh, I think we can talk about the invasion of Vietnam as a very critical point in this point of foreign affairs. But as far as on domestic policy. Um, there was the removal of the medic of the Medicare for all system in China following, uh, from what I understand, the uh, the liberalization of the economy more so. Um, you could take that up as a critical point, although at the same time, from what I understand, it was that in China, by still by the seventies, it was still subparly funded. Um, so, but nonetheless, looking at looking at the at, at the span of decades. Uh, you could see that there was progress to be made from that. And China has been relatively well off of, of having made, made these uh, con either compromises, concessions, uh, or otherwise. So there, there's, a, there's a great deal of discussion there. And you know, as we fast forward to today, should you know? Should China be doing the whole uh, exporting weapons to here or there? And if we no, no, of course, no, no, of course, the answer is no. Um, we see this discussion happening in the Philippines to a sort of extent where uh, the Philippine Revolutionary Communists are constantly blamed for being in line with China or following the orders of the CPC and these other sort of sort of blatant false accusations when the Philippine. Uh, Revolutionary Army, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, People's Army. Thank you. Um, has made made repeatedly statements against the Communist Party of China, 
on other uh, sort of questions. And this comes into the whole South China Sea discussion and both whether or not this or that. That's a lot of discussion. I'm not going to get into exactly tonight, but um, I think it's definitely going to be a discussion that has to happen among Asiatic countries, not not people like myself who are deep in the United States. Yeah, China has a state run economy. Uh, they have five year plans and they have raised millions of people out of poverty. Uh, yeah. You know, and that is a huge achievement, and it could only be have been done with a state-run, centrally planned economy. Look at all the countries in the developing world that have free market economies, and they're still dirt poor. Look at India, for example. India is a very big country, but the people there are still deeply, deeply poor because they've still got capitalism. Um, you know, all of Africa. I mean, China used to be the sick man of Asia, but with Communist Party leadership and planning, they've done amazing things. Now, there's some people who look back at the Mao era and say, well, during the Mao era, you know, it was more "quote unquote" socialist in the sense that it was more fair, or it was more government run. But during the Mao era, most of the country didn't have running water. Most of the country didn't have electricity. Most of the country, you know, were in the countryside. You know, yes, you know, they, they had industrialized certain areas, right? You know, but most of the country was just dirt poor. And the gang of four, you know, who were, you know, in the final years of Mao's life, that was the clique that was in power, basically said that, um, it doesn't matter if China stays poor. It doesn't matter if most of the people never get to see a doctor in their lives and never get electricity, as long as we're staying true to the revolutionary line, right? As long as we're being ultra revolutionary and following the true revolutionary party line, it doesn't matter if we stay poor, right? As long as, as long as we're, you know, true to our principles. Well, Deng Xiaoping, he said, poverty is not socialism, but to be rich is glorious. And pointed out, you know, when you read Deng Xiaoping's writings, they're widely available, it points out that, that in the Communist Manifesto and in all of Marx's writings, he says the point of socialism is to raise people out of poverty, is to, is to eradicate poverty, and to organize the economy rationally so that, that greater abundance doesn't lead to greater poverty. Under capitalism, people are homeless because there's too many houses. People are hungry because there's too much food. Right. The more efficient production becomes, the better you can make shit under capitalism, the poorer everyone is because then there's less jobs. Right. And that's not rational. Well, in a state run socialist economy, in a planned economy, you can you can have economic growth and people can get you know wealthier. Right. And that 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 and that the goal is to eventually get to a world with so much wealth and so much abundance that you don't need a government. Right. Mm -hmm. and, of course, of course. Yeah. And that the gang of four, you know, during the late years of Mao's life, they kind of lost that. In their minds, communism meant that you were just really, really egalitarian and sharing everything and all of that, kind of forgetting that the only way you can really have communism is to have vast material abundance. And so they, they shifted their policy and they started allowing foreign investment to come in and they started allow, but the goal, they, they did that in order to enable them to eradicate poverty. And they've been very successful in doing that. Um, and, and that's what was really going on there. So um, you know, I, I think that China, there's a lot to learn from. Now, there's a lot to criticize, too. China has big problems with corruption uh, and all of that. And um, But well, I mean, the, from what I understand is that they've, it, they, they do take very strict measures against uh, money launderers or otherwise. Uh, some of these folks, um, I, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, according to the Western media, you, you would hear that billionaires get uh, potentially death penalty sentences. Yeah, that for, 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 yeah. Nice. Yeah countries in the world that has executed billionaires. Now, I personally don't believe in the death penalty at all, right? Uh -huh. but, but that says something. I, I, can you think of any rich person in all of U.S. history who's gotten the death penalty? Not so, one! Not one! Oh, know, not one. Yeah, and President Xi Jinping, uh, the current president of China, I think he's shifting things in China. I think during the 1990s, the free market stuff got a little bit out of control. Um, but President Xi Jinping, I just got volume three of his governance of China. The first section is all about socialism and communism. There's quotes from Marx in there. There's quotes from Mao in there. I mean, the quotes from Lenin in there. I mean, uh, President Xi Jinping, Fidel Castro says he's one of the most capable revolutionary leaders he's met in his entire life. Uh, that's what he said, Fidel said before he died. And I think that, that China, you know, I think they were under the impression uh, that the United States would let them keep growing. Right. And I think there were probably some revolutionary communists in the party who said, eh, I don't think that's going to happen. But there was a big chunk of the party that was convinced that the United States would just allow them to keep growing and getting wealthier. And now with the trade war, with everything that's going on, China realizes that, oh, yeah, the United States is not going to let us continue to become a wealthy country, no matter how nice we are to them, no matter how much we lend them money, 
and and you know bend over backwards to be nice to the United States. They still they don't, they don't like. Want, it. It's very simple. The imperialists don't want to give up their superpower position or yeah. to anybody. They don't want to give up that hegemony that they have over the whole world. And seeing that China has that capability is threatening. Yeah. Uh, coming coming from the mindset of somebody who used to be highly uh, sort of like republicrat. Uh, Demo- Republicrat is what I'm going to call it. Um, somebody used to be steeped in the, uh, the ideology of the imperialists. Uh, yeah, th- there is a serious uh, sort of concern among people who want to support U.S. hegemony as, as the world police, you know, role as, uh, as as seeing China come forward and trying to put forward a economic order or an economic path that separates from the size fair free market capitalist system that we've seen in the United States or elsewhere that being promoted usually by like radio free your uh, li- radio free liberty radio something um, and a couple other re- libertarian organizations um, and that gets into a whole plethora of discussion yeah. in that. I, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, China makes half the steel in the whole world. Well, big American steel companies don't want people buying their steel from China. They want their buying their steel from the United States, right? Mm. Wow. Is the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world, makes huge numbers of phones. Well, you know, Apple doesn't want people buying their phones from Huawei. wants them buying it from Apple, right? The mm. China, China's crime is that it exists, right? At the end of the day, the imperialists want the whole world to be poor and buying all their shit from the United States. And, and, and if you ever bring up the discussion that you should, that in the United States, we should have uh, industry capable of being competitive with the free market. Oh, boy. Right. <laughs> imagine, imagine that. Right. Imagine Apple just making better phones, for goodness sakes, right? Oh, I mean, God. Imagine that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. No. All right. Well, it's been really great to talk to you, Wasea. I, I really appreciate taking the time to talk to you. Um, uh, it was a really great conversation. I'm going to post this on YouTube. Um, I'll, I'll make great, a great. nice thumbnail with a picture of the book we discussed and all of that, and I think it'll be good. Awesome. I'll throw my name down in the comment section so I can answer some questions for folks if they got some. Awesome. Well, great to talk to you. All my all best right. wishes.